Stephen, you're a real estate and trial lawyer here in New York City, the founding partner of Meister, Selig & Fine. Going all the way back to the beginning, what was your first job out of law school and, and what did you learn from that first job? I went to a large firm uh, in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. I just wanted to get out of New York at the time. But I quickly came back within a year and a half. Uh, I was only there, as I said, for a year and a half. I started to learn the trade and to learn the intensity and the focus. Uh, but because it was a relatively short stint, it, there wasn't much to that experience. Where did you go afterward? I went to a law firm here in New York called Herrick Feinstein, uh, which I uh, became a partner at in I think 1986 at the age of uh, 30 or 29, something like that, and um, stayed there for a little while longer and then left and uh, ultimately in the early 90s, 93 I think, formed uh, Meister Seelig and Fine. So you really took a big risk when you left this partner position at a prestigious law firm to start this new firm with what I understand was a couple guys just out of law school. I'm curious, what questions did you ask yourself before starting a new firm, and what made it worth the risk that you would have to take? Um, you know, after I, uh, Herrick uh, was a great firm, and uh, of course I, I worked there to become a partner and achieve that goal. When I was there in the partner slot, uh, as a young guy, 29 or 30 years old, with senior partners, uh, it quickly, uh, dawned on me, and this is just a personal decision, right? It has not the right decision for other people necessarily. That um, I didn't like having bosses. Okay, uh, I wanted to sink or swim on my own. And originally, and not that they were doing anything wrong. Even though I was a partner, I wasn't really a controlling partner of the firm. I left and went out completely on my own with no one, and then after a couple years ended up partnering with Mark and Tom and then the firm grew. So it was a decision to leave an environment that I didn't find fulfilling and so it was actually an easy decision for me. I'm, I'm not particularly risk averse. I mean I weigh my, my options but I'm, I'm not afraid to make a move. What makes you unafraid to make a move? How do you mitigate your risks when you're making a big move like that to go out on your own? Well, you know, I'll tell you, in the law, and I, I think in a lot of other professions, to me there's, there's one sort of overarching principle that uh, ensures success, which is to overwhelm with competence, okay? To just overwhelm with competence, to be better prepared, uh, to understand the subject matter, whether it's an agreement or a court case, better than anyone else in the room, anyone else in the courtroom, and everything happens and flows from that. Clients come, flow from that, victories flow from that, respect of your colleagues, leadership uh, potential flows from that. And so, because I, um, frankly, had confidence in my ability to be competent, I, uh, I, I wasn't worried about those risks. Who have been your mentors throughout your career and what role have they played it's, to shape it? It's interesting, because I left at a fairly young age, um, I haven't had a formal mentor since then. I did have a formal mentor for those several years at Herrick, a fellow by the name of Herb Mendelson, who was a terrific guy and a terrific lawyer, who really taught me the basics of the real estate transactional craft. I was a transactional lawyer in, in those days. And uh, ever since then, which has been a long time ago, that's 1986 or 87 that I left Herrick, um, I, I haven't had formal mentors, but I've had, uh, I've seen people who uh, judges and other lawyers who I thought were good at their craft, who, have, who I've admired and learned something from, and businessmen and women. Uh, but not a formal mentor since then. What have been the proudest moments of both your personal life and your business life? Okay, so I guess personal is easiest. My family, 
I'm very proud of my family. Uh, three children, two older children, uh, Jason and Jessica, and uh, uh, my wife Melissa and our our child uh, uh, Michaela uh, give me the greatest pride and joy, and it, it's what it's all about. Professionally, I, I guess I'm most proud of the firm. It's a great source of pride because it ends up providing sustenance to a lot of people, right? You have all the people that you work with, whether it's other lawyers or paralegals or legal assistants or receptionists, and they have families. They have spouses or significant others or children, and so it becomes a family, and it becomes a bit of an institution, and that gives me a great degree of pride about that because I help to build something that then helps all those people. In addition, um, I'll give you one little snippet, an example. A young man who worked as a, uh, an intern uh, or a, a clerk, I guess, for a judge called me up for a job and said, that we weren't hiring at the time, judge so-and-so said, if I want to become a commercial trial lawyer, I should work for you. And that's how I learned my craft. So naturally, that made me feel good. So when the firm is known to the community of lawyers, the bar, to the judiciary, and as well provide sustenance to this family of people, that's an accomplishment to me. How do you mentor the people that work for you? It's a challenge. That's a real challenge because I'm a very hands-on lawyer. I, I, I'm not one of these guys that uh, dishes it off. And so what that means is I'm very busy, right? I'm, you know, I was pressing to get a brief out to the last minute till I got in the car to come here to see you. So it gives me limited time with the younger people. But I try to do it. I just try to make time. Um, I have them write. I comment on their writing. You know, today you give someone a red line, they see the comments. So you don't have to sit there and, and discuss everything. And then you can, they can come to you and talk, well, why did you make this comment if, they, if it's not self-evident? And then, of course, at trials and meetings, I try to have the younger people attend. And then as they progress, make arguments, um, write documents, uh, do uh, witness examinations, etc. because that's the only way you're going to learn the craft. What is the best advice that you would give to young attorneys just coming out of law school in this economic and job market right now? Let me say this. I think the way to become a great lawyer is to learn every day, apply yourself. I tell a story, and it's a famous story in my firm. It's true. So back in the day, before everything was on computers, you actually had books, right? So the, the codified law of New York was in a big set of black books called McKinney's. It must have been, it was dozens and dozens of volumes, maybe 100 volumes. And um, I didn't really know when I got out of law school what was in all those black books. I knew some of it, but probably 5%. So I decided, <laughs> as a young guy, that I would take one of those black books home with me every day, read it until I was done with all 100 volumes. I don't know anyone else who's done that. I mean, I read the vehicle and traffic law, um, among other things. But you need to have that kind of thirst for knowledge and wanting to, uh, to make yourself competent in your field, and everything else flows from that. Now, in terms of jobs, uh, that's, that's a challenge. I had a challenge when I got out of law school. It was very hard for me to find a job. But uh, all I can tell you is if you keep at it, I think you will eventually get a job. And it may not be the job you stay at forever. But if you make yourself into a great lawyer, the rest will follow. You transitioned from a real estate transactional lawyer to a litigator. Why did you do that, and what did you have to do to make that happen? There's actually a, a funny story associated with that. I can tell it very quickly. I was a real estate transactional lawyer. I made an investment in a penny stock, which for me at the time was a large investment. It was about $100,000. I was probably 30 years old. And I lost all the money um, 
almost immediately. And I learned that the CEO of the company, I won't mention his name, I remember it, but I won't mention it, was that I really had bought his stock, okay, through a series of channels when I saw what are called SEC 13D filings. So I wasn't too happy with this fellow. And uh, I went to a public shareholders meeting and I kind of screamed at him from the uh, audience in that meeting and I sued him, okay? Pro se. I wasn't a litigator. By the way, I had just left Herrick and I was on my own. I sued him pro se. He ended up being represented by a very competent lawyer whose name now escapes me, but he was the, as a U.S. attorney, he had prosecuted Michael Milken. So he, he was much older than I was and uh, certainly much more competent litigation I, at that point in time. And I began to litigate with him. He was out litigating me, but I lasted. And eventually he made me a very reasonable settlement offer. He offered to pay me $75,000 of my $100,000 loss very quickly, and I turned it down, which shocked him. And he said, why are you turning that down, Steve? And I said, because I think I have an aptitude for litigation, I have no one to teach me, and I am going to make you my mentor, whether you like it or not. And I litigated with him for two more years, pointlessly from an economic standpoint, but it gave me a grounding in the field, and then I slowly began to take cases as a litigator. That's how I became a litigator. I was on my own, and I would say through 2000, 2001, my time was roughly equally split between transactional work and litigation. Well, certainly, as soon as the crash happened, now my phone rings mostly or almost exclusively for litigation, though it's correlated to real estate. So um, that's how I made the transition. So I never had a formal mentor. My formal mentoring was in transactional uh, real estate work, and I never had a formal litigation mentor. So you have taken Meister, Selig, and Fine from three attorneys to over 60 lawyers. Right. What has been the key to your growth? Well, first of all, it's not me taking it. It's there's people taking it along with me. I mean, I think I've certainly had a significant positive impact on that growth. But um, one key ingredient is that uh, I have a, a partner, Mark Selig, who is a fantastic administrator, whereas I'm not a good administrator. And so he, he has been able, with others uh, at the firm, to supply that infrastructure that's so vital. Um, you know, all the computers, uh, you know, and the people, and the space, and I mean, there's a lot to it, and I do none of that, okay? So thankfully, I ended up uh, partnering with someone who had skills in an area I don't have skills in, which, or maybe I just don't have the skills because I don't have the interest, but however you put it, it was a good marriage there because he, he, he supplied those skills. I would say another factor um, is that my personal success in my career has drawn attention to the firm and obviously clients, but also I think Another key ingredient is that we, the partners of the firm, have always been fundamentally fair to not only to each other, but to everyone at the firm. And so there is a very, very uh, low rate of people leaving unhappy. I mean, certainly people move, uh, had a partner move down to Florida uh, for family reasons, what have you. But for the most part, no one leaves the firm uh, unless we're not happy with them and we ask them to leave. And that's very important, obviously, to the growth of a company. So fundamentally, we're fair. We're fair with money and we're fair in all other aspects. Stephen, you're covered in the press a lot. Right. Um, you're known for being very bold and making striking statements and you're a real hard hitter. How important for success today is creating a personal brand for yourself, and how do you manage that brand? I think for me, I don't know if this would apply for everyone, although I don't think it was necessarily a conscious decision. It's my personality. Um, you know, my personality sometimes comes out in court, even though I'm not consciously trying to brand myself. 
there's a judge, I'll mention his name, he's well known, I think he's the senior commercial division judge in the state of New York, Justice Ramos. And I had a case where I was adverse to Steve Ross, who is a uh, very successful, very talented real estate developer. Uh, he owns the related companies, um, or he founded the related companies. And we were having a battle over a building in Columbus Circle where he built uh, the Time Warner project. And he had bought a mortgage against that property, and he was in default, and he wanted to get the building. And Justice Ramos is famous for putting lawyers under time pressure. He doesn't want people to take a long time. So it was a packed courtroom. Ross was in the courtroom. The press was in the courtroom. And I took the podium, and Justice Ramos said something like, Mr. Meister, I, I don't have a lot of time today. You know, I want you to explain this case to me in two sentences, or something like that. Um, so I decided, you know, I can name that tune in three seconds. I said, I only need one word, Judge. So now the courtroom's <laughs> hush, right, because I'm outbidding him. I'm going to go to one word. So I said, my client needs a Rossectomy, <laughs> okay? And I don't think, I thought Ross would take it in stride. I think he got mad at me. I, I hope he's still not mad at me, but it was just the, the simplest, bluntest way of explaining, I wanted to pay him off and get rid of him, and he wouldn't go away. So it seemed to me that was one word that captured the essence of my case. <laughs> <laughs> so be yourself and be creative. <laughs> Although I will say, you know, you can't do that at 30 years old. You just don't have the stock yet, the capital, to do that. So I, I don't want the judges to take this the wrong way. <laughs> but obviously, when you've been practicing for decades in front of the same judges, they know you, they know you work hard, they know you're honest, they know you do your job, you get a little slack. Not a lot, and it's not a place for joking, but um, Justice Ramos didn't mind. The courtroom did erupt in laughter. <laughs> but um, um, You made your point. <laughs> but you know, it wasn't, well, I made my point. <laughs> It wasn't uh, uncivil. It was a, a little sharp-tongued, but made my point. And, and we ended up uh, winning that case. You've either represented or opposed several famous figures, Donald Trump, Steve Ross, Larry Gluck. How do you operate differently in high-profile situations, or do you? And what is important to take into consideration when you are working on cases that are in the public eye? A good question. First of all, I will say that I do have trouble managing the brand in the sense that the reporters call constantly and I have all these deadlines and pressures and they're not necessarily trained in all this technical stuff. Not, not saying they're unintelligent, they're just not trained in it and the conversations can take a long time. Okay, So I often have trouble getting back to everyone. What I would say is that it really depends. There are some situations where it's critical to maintain a low profile. The client doesn't want the attention. That's not the case when I'm representing Mr. Trump, for example. But there are other cases when it's important to maintain a low profile. And it's just a matter of discretion and dealing with the situation. What I would say is there, there are clients who sort of reflexively say, say no comment, I think generally that's a bad tack because whenever you say no comment, it sounds like you have something to hide. And so I think it's better, even if you're making a short statement like the allegations just aren't true and leave it at that, it's better to say that than no comment, okay? I'm not a fan of ignoring the press. I think that leads to more problems. What is it that keeps clients coming back to you? It's the competence that you demonstrate, the mastery of the field. It's the respect that they see you get from adversaries and judges, right? Clients come to court and watch me. And it's making sure they know your case is important to me. All right, that because 
as you said, I have a lot of high profile cases and I've had more than one client say, you know, this isn't going to be your biggest case. Are you sure you're interested in it? Because they're worried that if it's not a big case, it won't have my attention. And the, the simple truth is that unless I'm willing to make every case that I take important to me, then I shouldn't be taking the case. So once I undertake a case, whether it's big or small, I make sure I give that case my all. In the law, in real estate, in business, what makes a good leader? I think it's the same mastery because uh, ultimately people follow someone who they respect. Um, they may take orders from a boss who has the ability to fire them, but they don't truly follow a leader unless they believe that person is committed, is working hard, and has the mastery of the subject. Now it's also important to try, I think, and I try to do this, I'm sure some people think I succeed and some people think I don't on occasion, but I try to put myself in the other person's shoes. I try to remember it's hard where I was at that stage in my career and what I knew and what I didn't know, but it, it's kind of hard to remember you know, what did I know five years out of law school that I, you know, and didn't know, um, as opposed to 10 years out of law school or 15 years out of law school. So it's a hard thing to do, but generally I think the people I lead from my firm see how much effort I put in, how much I understand the subject matter, and are willing to take my lead based on their respect over my mastery of the subject matter. In addition to leading your firm, you're a successful real estate investor, developer, businessman. You know, it seems like these days having your hands in several different business sectors and investments and projects is really a big key to success. Why do you think it's important? Well, I've invested with some clients in various projects here in New York, uh, projects downtown, projects on 7th Avenue. Uh, the real estate market generally has been a good, kind market to investors. I was uh, building high-end homes out in Nantucket for several years. I'm not doing that any longer. My wife, Melissa, is an architect. She was designing them. Uh, my partner, Mark, is uh, very heavily invested in the multifamily uh, market now and he's doing very well. So the firm is entrepreneurial and uh, you know still of course our bread and butter is practicing law but it's always nice to have your money working for you and not just you working to make the money. So what happens is there are so many cross connections between different different areas of business because of the free flow of information that I, I think it's helpful to be diverse on a parallel level, I always tell all my lawyers that I'm trying to teach the craft to that to be a really good litigator, you need to be a good transactional lawyer. And to be a good transactional lawyer, you need to be a bit of a litigator. Because when you're writing a contract, you need to understand what could happen in court if that contract turns into a lawsuit. And when you're litigating over a contract in a court case, you need to understand how contracts work. So, you know, the law has, has developed along specialization lines. I think it's too specialized. And I think when people be, become cubbyholed too much, they lose something or pigeonholed. You're also a pilot. Yes. How does this interest and skill enhance your life and your career? Uh, that's a great question. I'm a big fan of um, what piloting teaches beyond piloting. I think what piloting teaches more than anything is self-reliance, okay? Because if something goes wrong in that plane and you're flying it alone, there's no one who's going to save you but yourself. And anyone who's been flying for any length of time has had emergencies. In my single engine days, I had uh, an engine, the engine, conk out at me at night Okay, that, that was a bona fide emergency. I thankfully was able to glide to an airport and land uneventfully with no power. I've had electrical failures, I've had small fire smoke in a cockpit. So it teaches self-reliance. It teaches you to 
master everything. You know, in other words, you, you, you can't be a good pilot without being at least a half-assed mechanic, okay? I'm not saying I'm an airplane mechanic, but I had to be able to diagnose those problems in a split second, especially if you do any over water flying or over mountain flying. And um, so it teaches a self-reliance that people really need to, to understand because I find that one thing that happens to young people is they tend to think, well, someone's going to review my work. Someone's going to be there to catch the mistake. You have to work as if that safety net's not there. And that's the only way you'll get to that level of competence where one day you won't need it. And so I think piloting helps teach that. You wrote Commercial Real Estate Restructuring Revolution. Tell us a little bit about this book and why you wrote it. Um, you know, the real estate world changed, I think, after the third quarter of 2008 when everything was going crazy, right? I mean, think about what happened for a second. Uh, Bear Stearns collapsed. Lehman collapsed. Fannie and Freddie were put into conservatorship. There were several banks that collapsed and had to be taken over countrywide. Merrill Lynch was taken over. There were massive, massive uh, disruptions. And all of a sudden, all these documents that people would, that lawyers were churning out in the middle of the night under pressure were getting tested. And the results were unbelievable. I can remember, I'll give you one super simple example of how crazy it was. I think in 2009, I was litigating a loan that had an extension option. And I was on a, it was a big loan on a big property here in New York, and a lot of major players were involved. And I'm on the phone with a whole bunch of attorneys, and I'm hearing everyone describe their view of the, these sophisticated lawyers, of the extension option. And I realize all of a sudden, we're all not reading the same document. It's not possible for their views to be this different. And so I turn to the bottom of the document, and lawyers tend to put footers on documents. So as you're going through drafts, you might say, you know, point one, point two, point, you know. And I say to everyone, I name them, and there's maybe 15 lawyers on the phone call, tell me the numbers in the lower left hand corner. And sure enough, this five or six different executed versions of the document. In other words, probably what happened is some paralegal at some major firm or a, lawyer, or a young lawyer got a little confused at four in the morning when they were finally wrapping up this massive deal and it ended up being just different execution versions of the document, which obviously should never occur. So the mistakes were that fundamental and many, many other mistakes. And so I decided that there was such a shift in the way transactions were being documented thereafter and the, and the court cases testing them that I would write this book. So I wrote the book. Uh, it was a very big effort. The, you know, it has a fairly narrow audience, so the, the book as a, as a freestanding financial enterprise was not justified. But it w more than paid, sp paid off in terms of the reputational effects. So it was a, a worthwhile exercise, and I, I enjoyed the process of writing it.